<clears throat> Stan Christian greetings to each one of us here this morning. Glad to be here and worship God. And you know, this morning <clears throat> I was thinking about um, church and you know, I was expecting a small group and my mind went to <clears throat> Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I'm in the midst of them. And, you know, that's a <clears throat> thank, thankful to God that we have that promise that Jesus is where his people gather. <clears throat> He's not limited to one place. <clears throat> Yesterday... <clears throat> We started a new year, and let's say we have all this year in front of us. We don't know if we're going to reach the end of the year or not, <clears throat> but we expect that we will. <clears throat> we just completed a year, <clears throat> and I I know in the past I've preached <clears throat> messages on, you know, New Year's resolutions, and <clears throat> my mind was going through, um, you know, what's the difference between a resolution or a commitment, and that's actually the title, resolution or commitment, so I have a question for each of you, <clears throat> and you're not going to be put on the spot, so you don't have to be afraid to raise your hand. <clears throat> Who of you have ever made a res New Year's resolutions in the past? Okay. <clears throat> so some have, some haven't. Nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to read you some statistics. Most common New Year's resolutions are usually centered around getting healthy or simply living life to its fullest. However, despite your best efforts to usher in a new era of health, fitness, and overall well-being, <clears throat> research shows that even the most resolute among us are likely to lose steam in their pursuit of personal betterment per pretty early in the year. A landmark in 1988 study out of the University of Scranton found that while 77% of the people who commit, committed to a New Year's resolution stuck to it for, how long do you think? A week. You got it. They only stuck to it for a week. 77%. Only 19% of those who made the resolution actually fulfilled them within two years. They didn't fulfill that resolution in the first year. It took them two years to do it. 19%. <clears throat> Statistics have only gotten worse over time. We talked this morning about things deteriorating, our Sunday school discussion and getting worse and worse. According to a survey, <clears throat> only 4% of people who made New Year's resolutions in 2018 said they kept them. 4%. I don't know how, big, how many people were involved in this survey, but anyway. <clears throat> So if you made a New Year's resolutions this year, <clears throat> so if you stick to them, you're definitely in the minority. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> New Year's resolutions, so continue on. Over, of course, there will come a time when your willpower will be tested but will you be one of the many who gives up, gives in and gives up, or will you be among those who actually stick to their New Year's resolutions? 
Unfortunately, once again, research shows that the odds are not in your favor. Data reveals that the second February in January is the most common day for the formula resolute to start waving the white flag. Two weeks. Two weeks. <clears throat> when it comes to their New Year's resolutions. That means by January 14th, 2022, most will be New Year's resolution quitters. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> why do so many, so why do people ditch their resolutions after such a period of, short period of time? It's because typically <clears throat> people set long lists of lofty, uh, unattainable goals for themselves rather than small ones they might actually be able to stick to. I think most people think New Year's resolutions as something that I would like to do, but have no commitment to actually doing it. Now, I'm going to tell you about, <clears throat> I, w I didn't really plan on this, but um, a number of years ago, I, I made a New Year's resolution and I kept it, but it was a pretty simple resolution. Before I made it, I kind of did some inventory to see if I could make it or keep it. That New Year's resolutions was that I'm not going to buy a pair of shoes for the whole year. Well, I had plenty of shoes. <clears throat> My wife was telling me that you've got way too many shoes. <clears throat> so anyway, was that a big commitment? <laughs> not really. <clears throat> Making a commitment involves dedicating yourself. A commitment and a resolution. If you go into the dictionary, it, it, there are similarities, but in our, in our mind, the way we look at a resolution and the way we look at a commitment is actually two separate directions. Like I said, the way we look at a resolution is something that we would like to do. Commitment, we look at it a different aspect that we commit ourselves, we dedicate ourselves to it. <clears throat> a commitment obligates you to do something. Some commitments are large, <clears throat> like marriage, like committing our life to serving God. <clears throat> When you take a job, for instance, you're, com you're making a commitment to show up, to do, a, do the job well, and your employer, in turn, is, makes a commitment to pay you. That's just, you know, one scenario, I guess. <clears throat> If you would like to, turn to Romans 6, <clears throat> kind of going down through Romans 6, along with some other scriptures also, <clears throat> but <clears throat> that's the, the main text is in Romans 6. <clears throat> Resolution is a, I could say, a promise, pledge, an oath. Uh, And there we come again, a resolve, a resolution, a resolve to de uh, determine it, to be deter determined to steadfastness, firmness. I could say a declaration. It's something that we're not afraid that other people know about. How many people share their New, New Year's resolutions? Probably not very many, and that's probably a big reason why so many people are quitters after two weeks. <clears throat> or some people don't com don't are not able to fulfill them for two years. <clears throat> so <clears throat> before I start reading in Romans in Genesis three nine, it says and the Lord called 
unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So where are you this morning? Where am I this morning? Where are we um, in our commitment that, you know, in serving God or are we, why, if we haven't made a commitment, why have we not made a commitment? What is holding us back? <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? <clears throat> you know, God's grace, we don't have to. I, I just like that, you know, where it says, what shall we, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, we don't have to. We don't have to sin that God's, you know, we don't have, we will as human beings, we will fail. God's grace is there. We don't have to sin willingly so God's grace can abound. It's going to take God's grace to keep us on that path. <clears throat> to, how would you say, a commitment isn't necessarily that we never fail, but it's that we have committed to come back. We've committed to continue on. You know, just that, illustration or that um, of committing to a job it doesn't say that if I you know I, I commit to working for this company that I'll never make a mistake but I'm going to try to do my best <clears throat> and so you know it's not I don't want to compare the earthly with the with the heavenly, but there are still things that we can um, that we can realize there are there are some likenesses there, but um, but you know <clears throat> if we think of God, you know, continuing in sin so God's grace can abound, and how long would our would an employer have patience with an employee who willingly? Um, messes up things <clears throat> verse 3 it says know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life <clears throat> For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It just here just brings out that a commitment will um, bring a change. It will bring a change. Planted together in the likeness of death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. It's going to bring a change. <clears throat> Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. <clears throat> How, again, here's a, um, it speaks of being crucified in our, um, briefly, um, maybe it was this morning, that it was either in devotions or that it was, the comment was made, Jesus gave his life. You know, if we, picture Jesus being crucified he laid down and allowed himself to be nailed to the cross it's not like other men that were crucified that had to be held down but Jesus he gave himself and that's that's the same way that he you know a commitment it's not a forced thing it's a choice uh, that's the way uh, a commitment is a free will choice that each individual makes. It's not, it's nothing that is forced upon anyone. <clears throat> it's the same way if we think about it. <clears throat> Jesus was committed to come down to give his life on the cross for us that we can be saved. Think about it. What benefit 
did Jesus have personal, you know, we think of commitments, we benefit from it. Jesus, the benefit that Jesus had was because of his love for us, because he was willing to come and give his life on the cross that we can benefit from it. He also benefits from it because he loved us and that's why he did it. But it wasn't that we all signed up for it and said we'd do it and then he was willing, but he was willing to do that before any of us made a commitment. <clears throat> Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Just what I <clears throat> said about Jesus' commitment to come and die on the cross. Are we... Um, <clears throat> How willing am I to crucify myself, you know, my selfish nature? <clears throat> am I still, do I still struggle? I want to have my own way. I'm not willing to commit. I'm not willing to, you know, it's making a commitment is more than saying the words. It's more than doing it one time. It's a everyday decision. It's a, should I say, hourly decision, a minute by minute decision. We are faced with choices. Sometimes we fail that commitment and we have to repent and commit, you know, that's, that's where the grace of God comes in, that that forgiveness can cover, is there when we fail that, say that minute by minute commitment, that the blood of Jesus is there and will cleanse us again. <clears throat> but we don't, you know, <clears throat> if we continue continually do that if we continually think well we can you know I, I can do this and I can ask forgiveness and you know <clears throat> finally we become comfortable with that finally we have drifted away and we we no longer have we are no longer keeping that commitment we are no longer Asking for forgiveness, we become calloused. And that's the way that Satan destroys and um, draws us away from that commitment. <clears throat> because if we, if we think it's okay, we can do it and we can ask forgiveness. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not what God, that's not what Jesus intended. It's, it's for when we... Um, we do make mistakes, but not willingly. <clears throat> Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth, no more death hath no more dominion over him. In that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the way <clears throat> that we should live, that we are, we know what God expects. We know what God, uh, we know what is sin, what is right, what is wrong, and that we need to be dead to sin and alive unto God. <clears throat> In Luke 9, verse 23, it says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
it's it just you know take his cross daily it's not we do it once and then it's done we do it every day we make the choice <clears throat> galatians 2 it says i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me <clears throat> In 2 Timothy is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we say being dead with him is not taking, not, not um, looking out for myself, not taking not doing what I desire for myself, but it's, it's looking to see what God would have me to do, where he wants me to go, um, <clears throat> realizing that Christ, Jesus came, and he gave everything for me, for you, for all of us, and that should take away seems to me that should take away our selfish attitude and that we are willing to give also <clears throat> to sacrifice and not just try to take our own path. Verse 12, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. <clears throat> your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. <clears throat> Think about that. It's not, you know, it's not just my, not just my life being committed to God, but my hands and my feet, my mouth, um, you know, that I am using it to the honor and glory of God and my ears, what I'm listening, what I listen to, <clears throat> I can use those instruments as uh, for God's glory. <clears throat> Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law but under grace, God forbid. There it just brings in that question again. <clears throat> of shall we sin <clears throat> know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness so there it just tells us <clears throat> why we shouldn't uh, you could say another reason that we don't want to willingly um commit a sin because if we do we are yielding ourselves to as to a ser as a servant to sin and then it just says uh, to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are so if we choose if we think we can um, commit a sin and ask for forgiveness, we are opening ourselves up to the devil. We are, essentially, we are becoming his servant. <clears throat> and that's why, um, like I said, you know, it, it, uh, it's a dangerous path because finally we become comfortable with it. Finally, we, we don't, we don't ask God for forgiveness anymore because it's Satan's tactic of, of uh, deceiving us. <clears throat> and then verse 17, it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. It just, you know, that's kind of a... I always, when I read that, I like to put emphasis on that one word there. It says that ye were the servants of sin. Because... It 
shows a past tense. It's not, we are not, but we were, and that means, you know, we know that we are either servants of sin or servants of righteousness. That's the only two choices there are. And so, <clears throat> if we continue on, it says, But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. <clears throat> Being servants of righteousness. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> what is it worth to be a servant of righteousness? <clears throat> Are we willing to to commit uh, to do what it takes to be made free from sin to become a servant to righteousness? <clears throat> it's, like I said, it's impossible to be neutral. <clears throat> We all have masters, <clears throat> either righteousness or sin. And having said that, you know, and I've you know, kind of alluded to it, it's still possible um, for us to sin. It's still possible for us to fail. But we're not going to willingly make that choice. And we're not going, you know, as soon if if we do fail and, and we see we've, we have erred. Um, if it is a, you know, <clears throat> just speaking, um, let's say my own experience, if it's something, you know, um, I was tempted and I decided to yield to it and I know I can ask God for forgiveness. You know, <clears throat> I'm not, my past experience is that if I choose, if I make that choice, then I do not instantly ask God for forgiveness. But if I find myself where all of a sudden it comes to my realization that I have failed, I have sinned, I want to change that and instantly ask God for forgiveness. And, you know, um, so again, that's another tactic that where Satan weakens us because we, if I make the choice to go against what I know, to not instantly ask for forgiveness, that's just, you know, it's just another tactic that Satan uses to, and you know, if that is a habit that we think is okay, you know, you put it off and you put it out of your mind and maybe you forget about it. <clears throat> In Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It isn't something that, it's not the good that we do, but it's because of God's mercy that he, he, wa he saved us, he washed us. <clears throat> you know, it's not, how would you say, it's not, a great, it's not a great work that we need to do that we can be saved. It's not something that we can buy that will save us, <clears throat> but we just need to accept it as God's love. And, and follow his, his direction. <clears throat> you know, past failures don't have to give us a negative attitude about something, but we can, we can learn from it. And uh, if we, you know, we don't need to focus on it and continue to, um, look back and see, you know, what I've done wrong. And, but, but we need to learn from our mistakes so we don't make, so we don't continue to repeat and repeat and repeat them. <clears throat> Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 
here's a, a, uh, a story of a four-year-old boy that he got into this spirit of the new, making a resolution. <clears throat> uh, but uh, well, I'll just I'll just read it in. It says uh, he got he was getting to the his name was Cole. And he was getting to the spirit of New Year's resolutions. He said, "Putting away your toys is a good idea because you won't you don't want to step on something sharp." And then he goes on and, and he says, "It's important to wash your hands. That that'd be a good idea to wash your hands more often because you don't want to spread germs." So <clears throat> then then the question was put to him. Would you commit to these resolutions for yourself? And he changed the subject. He didn't. He didn't want to go on. And that's you know, um, maybe that's how deep that sometimes resolutions go. They're just a, they're just a good idea. <clears throat> or. Or we, we look at somebody else and we think, well, it'd be good if they change this in their life and, and we don't want to, we don't, why did it stand out to us that that person needs to change something in their, in their life in that specific area? It's probably because we have the same tendency in our own life. <clears throat> it's a lot easier to, to see or envision resolutions than to make them. Um, and it's like like I shared in the in the beginning. It's even harder to keep them. <clears throat> but <clears throat> that's why that's why I uh, that's why commitment is is so much better. Um, I think that if we if we make a commitment, it, you know, we look at a commitment as a lot of times when we re use the word about somebody made a commitment, we're referring to a life-changing um, choice. And, and that's why, you know, and if it's a life-changing choice, then it's not something that we're only going to do um, it's not so, it's not something that we're going to do at the beginning of the year. We're not going to wait till the beginning of the year. We're going to whenever we see that we want to make a change, we're going to make that change. And and it's not that we only think about it then, or maybe another week or whatever. But we're going to think about it day, you know, hourly continually as we go through our life and and for sure every every day as we begin the day <clears throat> James 4 verse 17 it says therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin <clears throat> so sometimes you know we we know something you know we should do and um, yet we fail to act on that because uh, well, we can, we, we start making excuses for it or we start looking at the cost, what it's going to cost us or, um, you know, what if it doesn't work out? <clears throat> here's, a, here's a story of a, a young slave boy, Frederick Douglass. He grew up as a slave in Maryland in the early 19th century and experienced slavery very brutally. He was taken from his mother when he was only an infant. For years as a child, all he had to eat was runny corn meal dumped into a trough that the children fought to scoop out with oyster shells. He worked in the hot fields from before sunup until after sundown. He was whipped many times until blood ran down his back, kicked and beaten by his master until he almost died. Even so, when Frederick considered trying to escape to freedom, he struggled with the decision. He had two great fears. And isn't fear often what, what hinders us from making a choice? 
<clears throat> First, he was leaving behind his friends. He didn't want to leave his friends. And that was his main reason for not making the choice to escape the slavery that he was in because he didn't want to leave his friends. He says, I had a number of warm-hearted friends in Baltimore, friends that I loved almost as I did in my life, and the thought of being separated from them forever was painful beyond expression. He said, it's my opinion that thousands would escape from slavery who now remain, but for the strong cords of affection that binds them to their friends. And you know, <clears throat> that's sometimes the reason that people fail to make a commitment to serve God because they think of what their friend, their, they got to leave their friends or what their friends might say or, or whatever. His second fear was this. If I fail in the attempt, my case would be a hopeless one. It would seal my fate as a slave forever. Well, I don't know why he had that feel that way because why couldn't he have tried again? Yes, he, probably, he surely would have probably endured brutal, um, uh, brutal punishment for it. But <clears throat> anyway, today people find themselves in slavery to sin and who think about escaping to freedom in Christ may have similar fears. They may fear leaving behind friends. They may fear they'll fail in their attempt to break free from sin and live free for God. They should take heart from Douglas's experience. On September 3rd, 1838, he remembers, I left my chains and succeeded in reaching New York without the slightest interruption of any kind. I have been f frequently asked how I felt when I found myself in a free state. It was a moment of highest excitement I had ever experienced. I felt like one who had escaped a den of hungry lions when he was finally willing to make that choice. <clears throat> Matthew 19, 29, it says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. That's the blessing. That's the reward of choosing to serve God. <clears throat> Sometimes we miss the big picture. We don't, uh, we miss the blessings because we don't look at the big picture of what God has in store for those who are willing to forsake all and follow him. Psalm 40 verse 3, it says, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust and shall trust in the Lord. <clears throat> that's, uh, I'd say that's a, if we choose to forsake all, and we, we'll have a new song, we'll have joy, um, even, even if we think of some pain or suffering that we might have to go through, <clears throat> trust in the Lord and God never asks more of us than he also gives us strength to fulfill <clears throat> but the uh, in in making a choice it's there's nothing like it's not a we can't um, there's nothing like a half-hearted commitment it's either a commitment or it's not I mean we can't serve two masters it's it's we only if if we think we can you know a half-hearted commitment is is no commitment at all <clears throat> in 2nd Corinthians 5 17 as it says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are new you can't have well, it makes me think of, the, I think it's in Matthew where it says you don't put new wine into old bottles, they'll burst and you don't have anything. Uh, the same way in 
in a, in a commitment for becoming a new creature. Old things ha- are pass away and everything is new. <clears throat> in Ephesians 4 also brings that out. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. <clears throat> In um, Romans, another, I didn't really have it in my, in my text, but in, uh, in my Bible, I have the verse highlighted. Romans 6, verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Just, again, it brings out both sides of, <clears throat> of uh, the choice of, you know, we think that, <clears throat> uh, You know, commitment is a is a big thing to choose to commit to something, um, regardless of what you know. Even if we're not talking of spiritual things, if we're talking of material things, of committing to something, it's something. Um, it's it's something major, but by often, or no, I should say always, by. Failure. We look at something that we would like to, we would like to have, and we're just not sure of the total cost, and we fail to commit to it. In reality, we are still committing to staying where we're at. <coughs> Philippians four verse eight says, "Finally, brethren." Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. <clears throat> it's a thinking of um, taking a, a, a visual uh, view of everything that's included and not just... Um, too often our, our failure to act and to commit is because we're too comfortable where we're at. We're too afraid of, of, a, of change. We know, we know where we're at, what it costs us, what it, what it takes, and we're afraid to, uh, just like the, uh, the young boy that was afraid to try to escape the slavery. The cost looked too great. After he experienced the freedom, he would never go back. So, you know, it's, I think we can all look at areas in our life and maybe it's in, in the past, maybe it's things that I'm facing today and I'm afraid to make that commitment because I'm unsure of the cost. But what is, what if we truly evaluate whatever cause, whatever brought to my mind to consider it? And if, if, we, if we look at that and we see the, the great benefit of com- committing, why do we hold back? Shall we kneel for prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this new year. We thank you for the past year. We know that we're not perfect. and We thank you that you are, your grace reaches out and forgives. And We just ask that as we go through this new year that <clears throat> we can be committed to you and that you're name would be glorified through us and through our life and help us as we go through our life to 
uh, bring honor and glory to you and that we realize we can shine for you and that those that uh, are lost and dying about us that we have a burden in our soul for them and that we can reach out to them <clears throat> just give us strength as we falter and struggle with um, making decisions of commitment and that we can take a look at the full picture and realize that you you are the example you have given us a good example and that we can follow your example and trusting that you provide for our, our needs and you can never let us down we thank you for your great love and that you're you can be everywhere and that your presence is with us, with us here today. Just be with us through this week as we face struggles, trials, decisions, whatever it might be, that your name be glorified. Just pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to open it up for testimony, correction, whatever the Lord lay on your heart.